I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, hey. Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI and Traction. Today's Traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Growth Lasers. As you're joining, please introduce yourself in the chat, what you're looking to get out of this session, what's your name, and where you're tuning in from. Like I'm tuning in from San Francisco, Nick's in Phoenix. Where yeah. are you guys tuning in from? Uh, hit it to everyone. Tel Aviv. Wow, we get an international audience here. Awesome. Great, great topic here today. And as you have any questions, type them in the Q&A tab and we'll take them at the end. So the dream of every startup and founder is to exit via an IPO. And if that's not possible, maybe an acquisition. And couldn't find a better, a more fashionable, a better speaker than Nick Mehta here. He's been our favorite and repeat traction speakers. He's the CEO of Gainsight, which pioneered the customer success category, built an award-winning culture, and recently was acquired by Vista for a billion, 1.1 billion. And his first CEO role was at Live Office, which was also acquired, which was also acquired by Symantec in 2012 for 115 billion. So Nick knows everything about building, scaling, selling startups, creating categories, and more importantly, how to sell gracefully. Welcome back to Traction, Nick. How are you? I'm doing great, Lloyd. By the way, small correction: the first one was 115 million, not 115 billion. Otherwise, I, I, I wouldn't be in a Phoenix hotel room right now. No. Um, <laughs> Really excited to be here and talk about it. As as um, I mentioned in the community before, you know, this happy to share our experience on both of them. And the second one's kind of pretty different because it's really new investors, and now we're in the next phase of our company trying to trying to take to take it to the next level. So I'm happy to talk talk about the journey today, but also where we're trying to go. Awesome, yeah, and a great uh, show of people here from Tel Aviv, London, Vancouver. Awesome, Munch love all the entrepreneurs that you bring together, Lloyd. It's so cool. Amsterdam, et cetera. Awesome. So let's get right into it. You've had a super successful career in tech. Give us your backstory. How do you even get into all of this? Thanks. Yeah. Well, I hope, hope like for all of you that are our best successes ahead of us, but my, I've been very fortunate to be um, in tech most of my career. My, my dad um, was actually an entrepreneur in technology. Um, he ran some really small companies. Nothing ever became big, you know, like 20, 30 person companies when I was a kid. And so I grew up around technology. I, I still have these memories of being in our basement and like my dad would he actually was kind of selling computers like this is back in the 80s and 90s and so we had all these computers in our basement and he'd always bring home new computers and I was like a kid in a candy store for me um I loved computers and like uh this is again some of you might appreciate this but back in the day you would get a computer and you try to put in new ram ram cards and put in new video cards so you could play your video games and I was that kid I I, I certainly did not have a social life at all I was actually pretty pretty introvert, actually surprisingly, and not nearly as as uh, into fashion. But um, that was my childhood and, and kind of growing up around tech. And then um, I got into entrepreneurship. I was I went to undergrad and studied um, actually biochemistry, um, mainly just to please my mom, who wanted me to be a doctor. She didn't want me to do anything in technology. Um, so for three years, I gave my mom the hope that she would actually have a son as a doctor. And then that hope was lost, which she still reminds me every day. She's like, it would be so nice to have a doctor in the family. It's too bad we don't have a doctor in the family. Other people are so lucky they have a doctor in the family. Um, but I ended up uh, doing a master's in computer science, kind of following what I was always into. Started a company in college with some classmates. I was a co-founder of a startup in the early internet era. Company was really hot for a while and then ended up not working out. So we're kind of the boom and bust story. And then I worked in a big company for about five and a half years. It was a product manager, then a, eventually a VP and GM at Symantec. Some of you probably know Symantec. And then I ran a SaaS company, as you alluded to, Lloyd, uh, called Live Office, which I ran and sold. And then we, we launched Gainsight in 2013. Awesome. And what do you think were the key traits and route to becoming an entrepreneur? What, what do you think was your most valuable job to become that founder? Number one skill is I figured out, actually, when I was at Symantec, that I don't like working for anyone else. That's the, that's the number one, I, I don't know, probably some of you can empathize. It's like that desire to do your own thing. And very specifically, I remember I was at Symantec and I, I was actually a general manager and VP responsible for an acquisition of a company we bought. We bought a startup and actually did really well. And I ran this business kind of like it was my own little company. Um, we had a culture, we had all hands, we had kickoffs, we had our, everything. Um, but then at like, you know, every now and then I realized it wasn't my company, you know, like the big company, the semantics, great company, but they would make changes and I didn't really control them. And especially, especially around people. That's what I care the most about is people and values and culture. 
and so I would say the biggest thing was a desire to kind of do my own thing. I, I think that's probably, if you really like honestly talk to most entrepreneurs, sure, there's other things, there's, you know, envisioning the future and hustle, blah, 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 blah. I think part of it is just like you want to do something on your own. Because uh, I, I, frankly, it's probably much more economically rational to go work for somebody else. Um, you know, less risk. I mean, Lloyd, look at you, right? You're, you've been, you put it all on the line and now you're having some success, but like, uh, you know, it's like you could have done a lot of other jobs. And so I think part of it is just, you want to do it on your own. Definitely do it on my own. And then the second thing I think is, well, you're one of the most fashionable CEOs in SaaS. How did that come about? <laughs> well, well, Lloyd, I think one of the most important things is if you aspire to do something, always start in, an, in, an, in a group that has a low bar. So if you said fashion in technology, like if I had to show up in fashion in Hollywood or even like New York, I'd have, no, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even make, reach the, uh, make the mark. Uh, joking aside, you know, I do think there's something about standing out. You know, you, I remember reading this blog post a long time ago that said, if you want to network and build a network, you wear red shoes. And the idea was basically you have something that's like a conversation starter that you go to an event and you stand out. And, you know, some people don't like standing out, which is totally fine too, but it's kind of nice if you find something that feels authentic to you. Like I actually love, you know, clothes and fashion and stuff like that. And it, then it becomes a fun, like, you know, icebreaker and it lets you stand out and build your own brand. And I remember I was at um, Saster, which, you know, many people in this community know Saster. And I was I spoke there in like 2013 or 2014, I think it was, no, it was 2015. That's the first Saster. And like Jason Lemkin, who's the founder of Saster, as a joke, kind of sent me a little plaque that said, a best dressed award at Saster. I was like, oh my gosh, okay. Well, I stood out. So then you kind of you kind of make your thing. So I do think that like there's some value to figuring out what your thing is, you know, whatever. Mine isn't just fashion, it's in the science and music and all kinds of stuff. And you lean into your thing and you make it your thing and it and it really helps. Definitely. <laughs> Fantastic advice there. So you know, Gainsight, you pioneered a whole new industry, right? I mean, people didn't know what customer success was until you guys came around. What made you decide to start the company and what else did you consider after selling live office? Yeah, totally. And by the way, just so, so the history is correct. So I, there are two guys who actually came up with the idea for Gainsight, Jim Aberlin and Sridhar Pedaneni, and they were pitching an investor and I had a similar idea and I met our the battery ventures met through those investors. So that's kind of how we ended up launching Gainsight together. So they, they are a very important part of the story and they had started another SaaS company before Gainsight. So they'd felt the pain firsthand and, and so my story was I ran this company live office and Lloyd, I was, you know, just like and many of you, I was sitting in meetings running this cloud business and I, and I had all this great data about marketing and all this great data about our sales pipeline and sales force and our billing data. And then when we talked about our customers, you know, we just like literally brought up a spreadsheet and had to guess about, are they happy? Are they going to renew? Are they, are they going to expand and so on? And so I remember sitting there thinking, God, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so when we launched Gainsight in 2013, we had this idea that every SaaS company would need this, and specifically every SaaS company would need this new role called customer success manager. And everyone now in SaaS is like, duh, Nick, obviously everyone knows that. But in 2013, frankly, people didn't. Like there were probably about 500 CSMs in the world in 2013. And I don't know how much we charged for our software back then, maybe a few thousand dollars a year. Like, what are we going to build a $2 million business, right? Like there was no business there. So what we said was the only way we'll ever be a real business is not to like sell software to CS teams, but to convince people to have CS teams and convince them to buy into the customer success concept and buy into doing things differently than they've always done, which is the hardest thing in the world is getting people to change. And so we, we kind of jumped and like pushed that rock up the hill and said, Hey, like, like let's write a blog post about why you need to invest in customer success or how you should compensate your CSMs or where you hire CSMs for, for, from. And, you know, that turned into, you know, three published books, thousands of blog posts, you know, thousands of podcasts and events like this, you know, a huge conference of 20,000 people at it, similar to what you do at Traction, Lloyd, as you know, Pulse, our conference is not about Gainsight, it's about the CS profession. And so we basically, out of necessity, had to help create a category. And like I said, we didn't create the category on our own. Many people helped. We just kind of, fan, we're like the cheerleaders for the category. And we helped kind of accumulate the knowledge from all the amazing people in the community. But we did it out of necessity. Like I, there's a lot of amazing businesses where you're not creating a category. You're just building a better product and more power to you. In our case, we had to create a category. There was no other option. You know, I, I came to the first Pulse conference and that's where I actually- I know. I, I, I met Byron Dieter 
who then got me in his other company, Speakeasy, where I, where I ran for a few years. Right. But, uh, and, and I learned everything about community building from, from that one conference. And then we launched wow. Traction. We, so we, built, we, we built the community before we even have the product. But in a sense, you built the community before you had the product, right? Or, That's right. Or not. Literally the same thing. We, we, you know, in 2013, we had, we had like a demoware product. I'm sure Lloyd, you've been in enough product development where you're like, look back on what you had in the beginning. You're like, oh my God, that wasn't really even a product, right? And that, there, it's possible there might even be an early gain site customer on this call who would attest to that. Like what we did early on is so limited, but we have this vision and the vision, by the way, wasn't from us. It was from this amazing community. And we saw that these people wanted to get together. That's the most important thing. Kind of like what your events, right? You've identified this need for people to get together. They have a common belief, a common set of experiences. And we saw that these customer success leaders were like, I need to be with people like myself, right? And I've done from 2013 to literally last week, I've done you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of events. And very commonly, the thing that people say at the end of the event, including what somebody told me in London last week at our event, is I asked them, what's the best thing about these events? And they said, well, you know, I left feeling like I'm not alone. There's other people going through the same stuff. I left more confident in what I'm doing because I'm not just making it up on my own. And so what we figured out, Lloyd, was there's this community and we just need to host the community, bring them together. And then the benefit was, obviously we, we built a relationship with them. We built trust and they were very kind to like, you know, in many cases become customers, but also we learned from them and we learned what product needs do they have. Very similar, I think, what you're doing with your business where you've learned starting out in kind of where you started and now you're learning all these other needs that R&D teams have, right? Lloyd, you're just like learning all this stuff just because you've been in there and you earn their confidence. So we earn the right to like host the community, bring them together, learn for them, and then, you know, eventually brings many of them on as customers. So, so that was a phenomenal strategy. Effectively, Gainsight is the poster child for category creation and community building. And, and a lot of people give Gainsight as a case study, but that helped you with early customer development, yeah. finding your first customers and, and getting that feedback even helped you get to product market fit, you'd say. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, you know, I just did a webinar actually literally just an hour ago with Jeffrey Moore, you know, wrote, wrote Crossing the Chasm, kind of all-time legendary business person, right? And he summarized kind of Crossing the Chasm really well, which is like, um, people below before they cross the chasm those early adopters all those people that you you know you and I deal with deal with in the early days the reality is what they want is they want to find people that believe in what they believe in right and then they'll give them the feedback and they'll become customers and so it was like hey nick nick believes in what we believe in by the way we had an important person early on named dan steinman who was our chief customer officer then and he co-wrote the first book on customer success with me and a, one other gentleman and so dan believed in what these people believed in you know they saw that like the way we we our values and our culture and it was this like shared belief and then that allowed us to do customer development they gave gave us the like opportunity to go like look at their spreadsheets and look at their internal systems. And I remember there's a woman named Dion Hedgepath and she was at um, a company called Aptio. And I remember sitting with her in like a coffee shop in Mountain View and like her showing me her custom internal dashboard, a kind of a custom version of Gainsight. And she's like, you know, this is what I have. And frankly, the first time she told me, she's like, I don't even think I need third-party software. And, you know, years later she became a customer, right? And so that I, those people that are willing to open up the hood to you, show you what they do, and then give you the permission to come back and you know pitch their business. That's what you get out of community, in my opinion. You build you build great relationships. I, I have this thing that I tell people a lot is if you build a community, you will not become a commodity because every That's tool eventually awesome. every every that. every tool becomes a, a commodity eventually. But in the early days, did you have any milestones that you set? Like, was there a no go? go or no go time frame to drop this and work on another idea because i mean you're no. creating a category yeah it's funny i wish i i probably should have had that um i will say that the, the there's a fun uh anecdote which is i remember we signed our first lease for like a, re, a legit office in in uh like i don't know march of 2013 and it was like a two-year lease and it was like oh my god it was three thousand square feet which felt like so much space and um you know it was a lot of money per month in our for, for us then right what i don't even know what it was you know 10 $10,000 a month, you know, fit. and I remember thinking, you know, I don't know if we're going to even be in business by the end of this lease, you know, two years later, right? Like literally I was looking at this empty space, like, are we going to make it? So I don't know. I should have probably had some go, no go or whatever, but frankly, we didn't. It just kept like getting a little bit better and it wasn't easy. Lloyd, you know, category creation is not easy at all. This is not Snowflake or UiPath or one of those that's just like, like that, right? But, you know, it's been a great trajectory over time. And actually, frankly, we're accelerating now 
Because I think one of the things, like you said, community prevents you from being commodity. Once you have a community, in some ways you do start accelerating. You become kind of a little bit, I, I, I hate the word unstoppable because you can always be stopped and there's always competition, but you become a little more, more momentum, you know, to preserve your growth. So definitely that's, that's fantastic advice. Was there, at, at what point did you feel that you had product market fit? Yeah. Huh. It's funny. I see a lot of people who are like, oh, product market fit is this magical thing. You cross this line and all of a sudden you had it. I, for me, I'm like all a business. I've never felt like all of a sudden something happens, but I think that there's some memories you have that feel like, okay, something different has happened. So, you know, first time we got a marquee customer, right? Um, Ubox was our first customer and they incredible partner to us over the years, right? And, you know, kind of early SaaS pioneer. And so the fact that they were willing to work with us, that was a marquee. Another one that I'm sure Lloyd, you can appreciate the first time we closed a six figure ARR customer um, that I had not spoken to and I didn't even know who they were. That was a big deal. That was like, okay, well, it's not really product market fit. It's probably go to market fit, but something is happening where you're actually able to do this without you having to go, you know, for when we got box, I remember I probably went to the lobby of boxes office in Los Altos, California, like 50 times, you know, literally like I knew the receptionist, I knew exactly their, I knew their Wi-Fi password. Right. But then you get that customer that you didn't talk to at all. And, you know, like this last week, we closed a customer for 1.3 million that I like met once. Like, you know, so it starts, you know, those milestones to me are, are really, really big. Another milestone, by the way, that it's not like a one-time thing, but I think that you can start feeling it. If you're in a new category, one of the hardest things is you're not trying to just defend the need for your, your solution in particular, but you're trying to defend the need for a solution. So why do we even need a customer success technology? Why do we need a customer success team, right? And so one of the things that happens early on is those, when your advocate who cause like really believed in what you're doing and they brought you in and when they leave, it's a really dicey situation because a new person comes in, they're like, I, I don't even know if we need customer success, let alone gain side or software, right? And so one of the big changes to me product market fit wise is when on average, sponsor changes actually either help you or are neutral. So now when new people come in to customers that are using Gainsight, honestly, the vast majority of them are like, obviously we need Gainsight. Like maybe we want to use it a little differently or whatever, right? Like, like no, very few sales leaders come into an organization and are like, why do we use a CRM system? Why do we use Salesforce? Like, honestly, you wouldn't, you would get fired. And nowadays, actually, a lot of our customers say that like the hire, the CEO wants to hire somebody who knows how to use Gainsight. So it's the opposite way, right? It's like, it shows up, actually Gainsight often shows up in job descriptions. And so that's another sign of product market fit. You could probably say, okay, how often is a company vendor solution showing up in job descriptions? And very fortunate for us, very often now it shows up in job specs. Definitely. And that's where you go from creating a category to becoming a preferred brand. Yeah, that's exactly right. You nailed it. Awesome. So, I mean, what were the key learnings from your category creation playbook? You must have a playbook. Yeah, totally. And I presented on some of this attraction a few years ago. So I'll kind of go back to my mental notes from you know, way back when. So just a few things that I talked about. Number one is, okay, um, it's very helpful category creation to have a, a face of that. And ideally it's a face with some credibility, like a personal story that says why they're doing it, right? And I think you've done a great job of this in your business, Lloyd. So it's like, you know, for, for Gainside early on, Dan Steinman, actually, who's the, he was the head of customer success at Marketo. We brought him on as chief customer officer. And he had all this credibility because he'd walked in the shoes of, you know, people in the community. And so, and then over time, I became, you know, definitely, you know, the face of the company. And we have others too, Kelly Capote, our chief customer officer, you know, many others, right? And so number one is who are those people they are going to put their, like their face out? It's not Gainsight, it's Nick Maida, it's Kelly Capote, it's Dan Steinman, it's Allison Pickens, our first, you know, CCO at, you know, after Dan Steinman and people like that. So that's number one is who are those people that are willing to put themselves out there? Number two is how do you find um, scalable ways to get your message out in authentic uh, fashion, right? And so that's where it's like, you're not just talking about your company's products, you're talking about the, the problem and the job, and you're talking about, in your case, entrepreneurship, right? So it's talking about something bigger than you in an authentic way. And so for us, that showed up in, you know, books and conferences and blog posts, but that were never about gainsight. They're just about the field. So that's number two is kind of authentically taught, scaling the content to be about them, not about you. Uh, number three is really like, I think there's a lot of value to bringing your vulnerable, authentic self to this community and to this category, right? And that's why, you know, 
I talk about fashion or we do silly music videos or whatever we're well known for. It's like authentic. It's like literally at night, I like am listening to a song and I'm like, this would be great to rewrite about customer success, right? There's something wrong with me, but I share that with the world. And we have our values at Gainsight. Um, we have, we, we call, talk about what we call human first business, the idea that like business is about human beings first. And, and we, talk, we have five values in the company and all of our customers, our community know our values. So we're very transparent about who we are. So that transparency, vulnerability, authenticity about your culture and who you are, that's the third thing. And then the fourth one, which I, again, I think you can empathize with, if you're creating a category, one of the most important things is patience. You know, you said, Nick, did you have a go, no go decision timeline? I'm like, no, honestly, at some point I'm like, this is just what I want to do. This is my mission. So it's like, you know what, I'm just going to do this. And the way I, the analogy I draw there for myself is when you're creating a category, it's like you go into a, a giant field that's like all mud and dirt, but you have a vision that like, kind of, if we put some seeds in here and we put some water and the sun helps us out, eventually it's going to be this amazing garden. And so early on, we were in the dirt, like in the mud, putting seeds in the ground and like getting dirt, not even good at gardening, right? But I always had this vision that like one day it was going to be a garden and I'm not going to leave and have somebody else get to see the garden. I want to be there for the garden, you know? So you have to have that patience. Like many of the mistakes I made, Lloyd, were like forcing things before their time, whether it was like new products or spending too much money or trying to close a customer it was patient. So I wouldn't do category creation, just to be honest, if you don't believe that the category needs to happen. Because that's what I believe. I believe what we do needs to happen, right? Not that they're changing the world or whatever, but just in the in the giant architecture of business, customer success is needed. And if you don't believe in that category in your soul, you won't have the fortitude to stick it out. And then somebody else will get to take advantage of what you did. Definitely. I think one of the other things you have in your DNA is giving before you receive, right? You got to fall in love with that customer. Yeah. And make make them successful That's beyond right. beyond the product or service. A lot of what you did was educate the market, educate the industry on being becoming better customer success professionals. That's and right. As, and then someday they needed software and they would buy you. You weren't forcing it. It's interesting, Lloyd. I think that's such a good point. I should add it to my list because it's really not. Don't be transactional. You know, it's about the long term and it's just trying to help people out. So, you know, one of the examples there, Lloyd, is, you know, I think most most categories, part of it is like there's people in jobs, right, that you're serving. And for us, it was a new job. And so I'm very proud that for myself and for many of our, my colleagues, we've spent huge amounts of time helping people in the career. And it's not just writing blog posts or creating, you know, webinars. It's literally like one to one. I, on average, I probably do five calls a week with people helping them in the CS career, like thinking about jobs and either breaking into the job or what their next job is or finding a job. So you add that up five calls a week, you know, my guess is, my guess is at least a thousand, 1500 calls over my time in Gainsight. I probably help, you know, a few hundred people specifically like introduce them to the job that they took, including some whose companies went public and it, it feels great. Don't make any money off that. We're not a recruiting firm, but it's sort of part of that like long-term orientation that's so important. Yeah, and you post you post jobs on LinkedIn all the Lost time. Jobs, like exactly. Yeah. But the but the the music videos are amazing. I I had a few customer success leaders like Minu Agarwal. Oh, Minu, um, yeah, totally. And they were all in that music video, which was which was fantastic. Oh, Everybody. great! Totally, I saw the panel you did with her. It was awesome. Yeah. So at at some point, your your category creation became this community, and then it became massive. It turned into a community of evangelists. How did you do that? I mean, it happened over time, but what were some key markers that took it there? Yeah, so, you know, a few things that I think really helped us. Um, number one was doing an event early, right? Just like you've done. And uh, there's so many events now. So I don't want to, like when we, in 2013, honestly, doing events wasn't as like fashionable in tech, using the term fashionable as it is now. And so our first Pulse conference we did, you know, we were like, oh, let's get 50 people there. And we had like 300 show up and 300 turned into 900 to 2000 to, you know, you know, we did a virtual this year, about 21,000 people, right? So so I think events definitely allow, allow you to kind of bring people together, but you have to have a novel audience, like some audience that doesn't have tons of things to go to and a novel story. So don't just like come throw an event, but if there's some community that's underserved, you know, that, that was one thing clearly. And, and when we do events, you know, we bring our personality, we always music videos and I bring my, my kind of self to this keynote and all that stuff. Right. So that's kind of one thing that we've really done. A second thing though, is not just the big events, but just connecting people together one-to-one, -one, Hey, you should meet this person, but also like 
tons and tons of like round tables. So one thing we do particularly actually gotten better at post COVID is we do like every month, you know, many virtual happy hours with chief customer officers getting together and connecting people together. And if you just host it, do an icebreaker question at the beginning and we'll get out of the way, people love it. So kind of those peer to peer round tables, not just the big events. Third thing that um, has worked really well for us, obviously content in general, right? Blog posts and all that, but everyone does that. But um, specifically uh, writing books, not everyone can write a book or should write a book, but in the case of our space, it was like so needed. And that customer success, the first book we wrote has like sold more than hundred thousand copies and translated into Japanese, Portuguese, Spanish, Mandarin, German, French, like it's amazing, right? And people like everywhere, they, they, they ask us to sign the book. And, and so the book actually Hebrew apparently as well, there you go. And so I love that. And so, you know, that's really, I think that idea of creating content and, and scaling it, that, that's, that's something that jumped out, you know, for us big time. Um, creating like initiatives to kind of help people in the profession, like I talked about, you know, helping them one-on-one, -on -one, but also we created this online university to teach people customer success, like an, a class. We created um, actually more recently, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, a program to bring people from underrepresented backgrounds, you know, underrepresented minorities, stay-at-home parents, military veterans, dis people with disabilities into the CS profession because it's hard for them to break into tech and we kind of give them an internship in one of our clients and we train them and so on. So I think investing in the profession, there's, that's a huge one for almost everyone that's out there. As an example, Lloyd, one thing we're doing right now is the next frontier in customer success is customer success operations, right? So just like sales has sales ops, right? Or revenue ops, customer success now has a big field called the customer success operations. It's really important. We're investing in it. So we've created a whole new kind of conference focused on that. Uh, just last week on Thursday, we had 2,300 people for our customer success ops unplugged event. And we had community building and peer-to-peer -peer round tables and, and everything else. That's awesome. And, 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 you know, I get asked this a lot because effectively, Boast has been a community-led company. Traction is over yeah. 15,000 people. We were able to bootstrap before our Series A because of this community. But everyone asks me this. How do you ensure your efforts in community building is also generating sales? And um, I want to throw that question to you. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Sometimes like the, the, the most common and most important questions are like the hardest to answer, right? How do you, another similar one would be, what's the ROI of having values, right? Like there'd be things like that, right? They're like, I don't know, but it's everything. And so for me, community is the thing that prevents us from being commodity. Actually, I never had a good statement like that. You just said, it's so smart what you said there. Um, and so I knew that long-term this is it. And I, and frankly, I, I spend more time on the community than like almost anyone else in Gainsight. Like I think about it all the time. Um, it's very hard to quantify. It's almost something like the CEO or founders or whatever. You almost have to like force it to happen. Like even if other people aren't, aren't into it and there's not an ROI model, you find money for it, you scrape it together and so on and so on. And so you just defend it. Now, later on, you can do kind of cohort analysis and you can, I'm sure you've done this, Lloyd, you people that come to Pulse, the likelihood of them to buy later on and, and so on. It's it, that stuff is almost just to justify it to other people. But, but uh, you know, I would say that it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to commu do community well if you just don't inherently believe in it. From 100%. 100%. Yeah. And, I, and I say that because for me, I effectively now have become head of community yeah, more it, than anything yeah. else. I'm like the and, chief community officer. Yeah, totally. And if you think about the transaction and try to squeeze every dollar, then people will see all your actions nope. as contrived and 100%. they won't. They won't, they won't buy from you. But now that you're at scale, what, how did you evolve? Like, you know, you started with the community. Yeah. You, you, it's become a movement. It's beyond a community now. Customer success is a movement because there's so many people attaching on that same mission. Um, but, you know, what are some things to think about going, changing a customer acquisition from early stages to scale? Yeah, totally. I mean, one of the things is, uh, so I, I saw a question in the comments about, about you know, how do you quantify the opportunities? So I think it's very important to have some metric that's kind of a leading indicator of, of your opportunity. You know, for us, it might one of the metrics could be the uh, early on is sort of the number of CSMs in the world. And that's grown a lot. Like I said, you know, now it's a few hundred thousand in the world for, from 500 when we got started. And actually for us now, the real metric is like how big SaaS is and, you know, how many SaaS companies there are. And so having sort of that North Star to me is extremely important. So you can kind of use that to like be the thing you're striving for. Um, but then, we, and so, and one of the things you have to do, I think, as you scale is really build out your data set of like, what is your addressable market and understanding how that's growing over time. So that's one area that 
is quite important as you scale. I think a second thing is if you're scaling community, it starts out with, you know, people like you and me being really passionate about it. So how do you get everyone else to be able to do it? So I'll give you an example there. You know, we did an, uh, we, we do an event called CXO Summit and it's for kind of like the senior executives. So it's an intimate, like 50, hundred person event. And we do, you know, a couple in the US every year, East Coast, West Coast. We do one in London. And I was in London for our MIA one last week. And, you know, what I was just blown away by was how they did it. Our team did it so well, 100% self-sufficient without any involvement from me, except like flying in just at the very end, you know, talking or whatever. And so that's where your values and your culture come in big time. If you want to scale your community, you, you're going to have other people talking to your community besides you. And so if you don't have well-defined values and culture, they're not going to be able to represent you and your company the way you want to be represented. And so it's important to have really well-defined values and culture and kind of playbooks for, you know, we have kind of playbooks for how to do a virtual happy hour, how to do an event, how to do a round table. One of the things we're doing right now, Lloyd, which I wish I had done sooner, is we're in the process of trying to document all of our processes and gain site. You know, we have a thousand people in the company. We're trying to, you know, trying to grow and move to that next phase of, you know, certain terms of financial investors and all that. And so... Yeah. You know, it can't, it can't just be a Nick's head or even a small number of people's heads. So one, one company we really admire is GitLab. I'm sure you know GitLab. Yeah. GitLab, one thing they do really well is they put every one of their processes online in a repository, actually using GitLab, a kind of an employee handbook. And the team at GitLab has been inspiration to us. They're a big customer of ours. And we're basically building kind of that handbook for Gainsight, but capturing everything about, you know, we're doing a virtual happy hour. How do we do it? Like, how do we do the introductions? How do we make people feel good? A lot of that's in your head. So I think that's a big part as you scale is getting that knowledge down and, and communicating it through values, but also communicating through written documentation so that other people can get up to speed quickly. Um, obviously, onboarding new employees becomes so important. We've gotten much, much better at onboarding. We have a really good onboarding process now. You know, things like that become important. But I think one other thing that's important is that's really challenging, not losing sight of the people that got you there. And I think that Lloyd, that's something so important. And I have a lot of that in my head, like all those early community members, I'm sure you have them for traction and yep. boost. Yeah, it's like those people that got you there. How do you actually like remember them and make sure your new employees knew, know who these people are? I think that's very important as well. Definitely. No, that's that's fantastic advice. Now, none of this, as you as you as you closed off with here, uh, is possible without the people. Right. So as a as as a founder, how do you ensure? You have the right talent as you go from like zero to 10 million and 10 to 100 million. Like who did you hire and in what order? Yeah, it's, I mean, by the way, we made tons of mistakes. And by the way, the mistakes were never because the people weren't good. It was like Gainsight wasn't the right fit for them, et cetera, right? It was, I, I believe all people have greatness in them. It's just like finding the way to bring it out of them. And so I, I can't say we are experts at this question, but a few things I think have happened over time. Um, one is, because our culture and values are very external, right? People know they, the music videos, all that. Like you wouldn't apply to Gainsight if you weren't into that stuff. And so I think that's one thing that is very, and we're doubling down on that, like really creating a lot of assets on your website and stuff so that people know who you are, truly who you are, not like the fake version, like the real version of who you are. And so therefore you hire the people, the people that apply to your company are the ones that actually are the right ones to work at. I think having some structured processes around assessing values to me, that's very important. What is the what are the what are the values of the company? How do we assess this person? You know, in that process, yeah, I think that's a really important area. Um, I think understanding that the needs of the company change and the type of people you might want to hire change as you evolve, right? So early on, one of the things we had a gain site was actually a number of people that came out of management consulting, um, because those types of people actually really get to learning new things. You know, whether it's like a Bain or BCG or McKinsey, they're really good at learning new things. One of our best salespeople like ever, but, you know, especially in the early days, enterprise sales, she came from BCG, our, our COO, um, Allison Pickens came from BCG, our, you know, number of our customer success people came from Bain, you know, in uh, McKinsey. And so hiring those people with like early on with the ability to learn quickly, be really creative, et cetera. And then, but then over time, you know, you, you start getting like, oh no, we actually have to have more specialized functional experts, right? Want to hire people that are really functional, functionally good at a certain domain. You're going to hire people from certain kinds of companies. One thing I learned Lloyd is because we're like, we've been you know, very fortunate to be very successful and all that, but this is not one of those um, autopilot zero to 10 billion in five years kind of companies, right? One thing I learned is I also appreciate hiring people that come from businesses that have done well, but weren't easy, 
right? So I have insane respect for Google, Facebook, Amazon, Stripe, et cetera, right? But those businesses have incredible tailwinds behind them. When you find somebody that joined a business, got it to 100 million of ARR, it was a little bit of a struggle, they figured it out. Those people did real, like hard stuff, you know? And so a lot of our most successful ex executives at Gainsight have had some challenging, not, not like bad, right? Not like failure, but not easy stints before Gainsight, which has been great. That is, uh, you know, a pain is the precondition for growth. That's right. So, oh, that's a good way to say it. Look at you. You got all these tweet, tweet worthy um, aspirations. I'm actually taking after you. I'm, I'm working on a book called The Art of Community, and you're going to be a case study on it. Oh, my God. That's amazing. I'm excited to read the book. Community is so big, man. Yeah. Awesome. So, in what order did you hire, build out your team? Like, who did you, who are the first people you hired to get yeah. you to 10 and then from 10 to 100? Well, okay. So, we, you know, one of our founders, Sridhar, was our head of engineering. And so we already had that set. So obviously it's so important, product engineering, et cetera. Um, and then um, early on, I hired our, our, who initially had a product management and, became, and now is our chief product officer, runs engineering and product. He came in very early, Carl Rumerhart. And, you know, he was one of those people, he, he had worked at like some big companies. He was actually at VMware very early through being a huge company. And then he'd done some startups that didn't work out. He did some startups that were like moderately successful. So he'd sort of seen the gamut, kind of like what we're talking about. And um, he's in, 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 just incredibly strategic and creative and still my, you know, right hand partner, you know, eight years later. Um, so having my product person, my engineering person, um, we had this, you know, for us, we had to have our chief customer officer very early because that was not only like the CS job, but like being the voice of the community, like we talked about, right? That this sort of two-way street. So Dan Steinman, so critical early on. Um, having this person who can be more of a general business person, Allison Pickens came in as our kind of biz ops person, but then eventually became our COO. And she was extremely versatile. Having this like really like incredibly creative, but also just like insane hunger enterprise salesperson. Her name is Rebecca Olson early on. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing like many, but like they're having this kind of mix of different people and different backgrounds um, was really, really fortunate for us uh, early on. So we, you know, it wasn't like, we obviously built out of companies where people in pretty much every role, right? But having, you know, a great enterprise salesperson, having a great product in engineering, having a good biz ops person, you know, there's some foundational roles that are important. Yeah, and what I, what I heard here is in the early days, Swiss Army knives and yes. then specialization. And specialization. That's right, exactly. Yeah. As you go to sale. So as, as a leader right now, post acquisition, um, what are some goals that you've set for yourself and, and your companies? Like how do you define success? Yeah. So we want to run we want to want this business to be around a long, long time. And you know, Vista is just a stage in that journey who are new new investors and you know, a lot of Vista companies after this go public. And so this is you know, you know, just a stage in the process. The way I talk about our company is I you know, we've been doing this about almost eight, nine years now, right? So I talk about kind of the company being in chapters. Each chapter is about two years. I call the chapters kind of G1, G2, G3, G4, and G5, like Gainsight 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so I kind of tell the story about the company in the early days, creating the category, helping to create the category and then building out our product and getting early customers. And so when we um, actually commensurate with us kind of announcing our partnership with new investors at Vista, we basically announced what we call G5, phase five of our company. And we said, okay, what do we want to be in phase five? And we set this set of goals. What, what We have always had this purpose statement that never changes through all the chapters. And our purpose of our company, which has nothing to do with customer success, it's, it's actually just about how we run our business. We say we want to be living proof you can win in business while being human first. So the idea is like some people think that, oh, okay, if you really want to be successful, you got to forget about all the people and the emotions and the values and just focus on the bottom line. And by the way, that probably works too, but we want to really show you can win while thinking about your customers as human beings, your employees as human beings, your community as human beings, right? So that's, that's, our, that's always our, our purpose through all the phases. But for G5, then we set a, a kind of a set of goals, right? Which are, you know, we're, you know, we, we've publicly said that we, you know, a while back past hundred million in AR and we want to get to, you know, to get past 200 million of AR and, you know, our business is accelerating. So we set a certain growth target and we set a certain, you know, retention and or all that metrics, right? You set all that stuff, right? But then what, what you do is say, okay, what's the vision of your product strategy to get there? And what we've figured out is, hey, customer success is part of this larger thing companies are dealing with, which is how do I improve my net retention of my business? 
So much of my value as a SaaS company comes from how you're able to keep and grow your customers. Net retention is about customer success, but it's also about how you build your product. It's about how you sell. It's about your customer. It's about your community. It's everything else. And so we're building kind of a suite of products and we have now a, a product that's all about product analytics and engagement and adoption called Gainside PX. We have our Gainside CS product. We have a product that's about renewal and expansion, more stuff that we'll launch in the future. And so we kind of set that vision of kind of the net retention platform as like the North star of where we're trying to go to as a company so we can get to those financial metrics so we can have lived up to our purpose. And then we always have our values as our foundation. And we, we actually turn this all into a diagram. So this turns into a one page diagram and it's like, a, it's like a mountain peak. So we're climbing G5 and at the very top is our purpose and then our metrics and then our vision. And then here, then we've got goals and metrics and all the other stuff. What are, what are your uh, values? So we have five values of Gainsight. They fit into this human first concept. So, um, the, you know, they've really been there almost since the very beginning. So um, one of the foundational ones that we call success for all. It means we want to, success for us is not just, you know, making money or having a quote unquote exit or whatever. It's, you know, driving success for our clients, um, driving success for our community as human beings, like tied to what you're talking about, driving success for our employees and their families, driving success for our, our shareholders, but all of those together, not just the shareholders. So success for all, um, what we call a golden rule, right? Everyone knows golden rule, treat people the way you'd want to be treated. Childlike joy, which means bring the kid in you to work every day. That's why we make the music videos and all that stuff. And that's how you do tons of things that are about being human. Um, shoshin, which is a Japanese word for beginner's mind, always approaching things as a beginner, always being open to new ideas and new feedback. And stay, stay thirsty, my friend. Some people may see the reference. There's a most <laughs> key commercial, the most interesting man in the world is thirsty and does, you know, doesn't always drink beer, but when he does, you know, and so we have the same uh, kind of uh, tagline of like that ambition and drive to do something big. So those are our five values. Great. But like now at scale, how many people is Gainsight? About a thousand. About a thousand. As a CEO, what is your biggest worry? Uh, definitely long-term that, you know, we don't live up to our purpose and values. That's the thing that I vigilantly, vigilantly fight every single day. And that's why I talk to, I do onboard all our new employees and I talk about our values every day. And I send an email to the company every week and I talk about our values and I talk about our values here and everywhere else. I want people to hold me accountable to them. That's the number one. Then inside that, obviously, like the other one would be, hey, we created this category and we didn't really get to take advantage of it. You know, like we built the garden, but somebody else is, you know, taking the flowers from it, right? So that would be the second one. But the biggest one is values and purpose, living up to them. So then how do you train the organization to make better decisions when you're not in the room? Yeah, so I think a lot of that is coming up scalable management processes. So some of that is, okay, great onboarding with really, really well thought out onboarding now for first few weeks in somebody's job. I speak to everyone about our values. Um, we have this management tool I was alluding to, that one page with our goals and our strategy and our purpose. It's called the one page strategic plan. There's a good book called Scaling Up. I don't know if you've read it, yeah. but it actually talks about that whole process. And we use that internally to kind of drive our, our uh, process. Obviously, then that turns into kind of OKRs by department and, and things like that. Yeah, Scaling Up's a, 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 a good read. And we we started using it as like 2015. We still use the, the, the core primitives of that every day. And then we, you know, we, one thing over, we're a thousand people. So a lot of infrastructure and people. I'm like, I have an incredible chief of staff, Robin, Robin Merritt, and she does an amazing job of then helping to make sure all of our communications cadence, like we have a really organized cadence, which basically after every quarter, you know, we do a quarterly business review with the management team, extended management team to talk about what happened. Then we do a board meeting to talk about with our board. And then we do an all hands meeting to talk about with the company. And so we're really organized about how we run the company. And I think that makes a big difference. Like everything from our weekly exec meeting to, you know, all that stuff, it's, it's just very organized. And I'd say that that's not something that like, I'm not, you know, it's not like I'm, my biggest passion is like metrics and process, but once you do that, then you can feel confident that the company's running and then you can do everything that you're really passionate about, creativity, strategy, and in my case, also community. So, I mean, if you treat your customers like, like uh, this community you build, I, I'm sure you're, I'm hearing many of the same principles applied to internally scaling. That's exactly right. Yeah, I think that's the core. The core idea here is break the walls. You know, it's the line between your, you, your company, your, your customers, your employees, like they're kind of artificial lines. They're just human beings, right? That's the, that's the core principle. Because I'm hearing QBR and, and weekly yeah. reviews. You, you talked about onboarding every employee or you're part of that. How, how, how do you make that work? What does that look like? I mean, it's like, you know, luckily virtual makes it so easy now, Lloyd. And we're very, we've always been very much distributed, remote first kind of company. Um, and so we do, uh, 
Uh, we have an uh, amazing team that designed this awesome onboarding plan. It's basically a partnership between our teammate success team, which is kind of what people call HR typically, and um, our kind of enablement teams. And they basically get together an all new game. We're hiring a ton. This year, I mean, we started the year at 700 people, when the year at like 1,250 people or something. So we're hiring a ton of people, right? If you include attrition, I mean, it's like we're hiring you know, 700 people this year or something. And so what we do is we have this kind of program for the first week. And um, people are brought, broken up into cohorts, you know, so there's, you know, 40, 50 people at a time. We actually let them name their group. So they almost have this identity of like being like a class, right? They have a Slack channel. They make videos about what they're most passionate about, a gain site. We introduce them at, at all hands, all that type of stuff. I'm sure many of you do. But then we have a, kind of diff, different trainings. And I, my training is 30 minutes every time, just about the value, the history of the company and then the values and purpose. That's what I talk about. I don't talk about our products or our business. There's many other people, but then other people come in and talk about the products and talk about the business. And yeah, it's pretty structured, but um, we actually measure net promoter score coming out of that onboarding. And actually we've been doing this new onboarding since, you know, call it, I don't know, April. And our NPS is about 95 or something like that. It's insane. It's like literally like almost perfect. Um, people really, really appreciate the onboarding. And that's ENPS. That's that's not just customer NPS. That's, that's employee. Great. No, this is employee. And I we do we do customer obviously separately, but the most some of the fastest growing companies or the, the top blue chip companies are like in the 50, 60 percent. So 95, yeah. 95 is humongous. It's is you've not only built a culture and a com community and a company, you've built a movement. And that's testimony to that. Yeah. Um, I want to get into selling the company here a yeah. little bit. Um, when do you decide or how do you decide whether to keep fundraising to grow or to sell? Yeah. Effectively, you, you sold live office, but then with, with Gainsight, although the press says it's an acquisition by Vista, it's really, you're operating it like it was a large fundraise. That's right, exactly. And for us, it was, you know, we really, like I said, this community, I think we're just getting started in customer success and net retention and all that. The best days are in front of us. So we did not want to end this amazing movie, right? And when you sell to a strategic, um, it's great. And by the way, that's what I did in my last you know, co company. I sold to sold our company to another tech company. And that's great and nothing wrong with that. But um, we wanted to keep going. And when you sell to a strategic, you don't get to keep going. You're part of something else. When you sell to an investor, it's just like new investors. And, you know, they're, they're going to give you some feedback. And, you know, in Vista's case, they've actually given us tons of investment to grow even faster and all that. And so um, for us, it was like, how do we double down and keep going? But also, you know, respect that our employees had been at this, you know, some of them seven years. So we give them some liquidity, which is obviously very nice, right, to, to help them take care of their kids school or houses or whatever they need to do, right? They worked so hard and then um, give our investors a chance for some liquidity, but actually many of our investors actually kept their stake in Gainsight. So they actually, what's called rolling their equity going forward and then get some new investors. And then what, one of the things that was really attractive was this is really, really good at this kind of growth stage. And they're very aggressive on growth and like, like just doubling down. And so we were psyched about that. And so we were, the other thing that's nice about Vista is like, it's, it's actually like, this is gets into the nuance of startups. It's all like common stock. Like there's no preferred stock in Gainsight anymore. So we're all on the same footing and we're all in it together. And like, now we just want to, you know, triple, quadruple, quintuple the valuation of the company. And, you know, maybe, maybe that means, you know, going public or whatever it means. Right. But we want to go to that next phase. And they've been amazing partners. Actually, a lot, what, the way I got to know Vista was a lot of our customers were in the Vista portfolio, like 30, about at the time, about half of the companies in the Vista portfolio use Gainsight. And so I know all the CEOs and they're like, yeah, they're great partners. They're great people. Um, actually, it turns out they're super passionate about diversity, inclusion, uh, equity. They're really, really um, passionate about like environment and sustainability and governance. And so, yeah, very excited about that. Definitely. You know, I think I, I, I am very bullish on Gainsight. I think you guys are going to be a giant public company. If you look at it, Salesforce, the system of record for, uh, for CRM here, right, for customer for sales. And HubSpot has effectively become the system Amazing. of record for, for marketing, also created a category. Uh, Gainsight is the system of record for customer success. I'll, right? I'll take that. I'll take that. That's our goal. <laughs> but, you know, how did you build this relationship with Vista? Like, how do you build relationships yeah. with potential acquirers, right? How did this, this come about? It, it was, it's funny. It was 100% nothing that we proactively did ever. We, we uh, what happened was Vista reached out to us like, you know, five, six years ago. And we were like a tiny company. We're like, they don't even know how small we are. Like, why are they talking to us? But I was like, God, they have a great portfolio. I'd love to get them as customers. 
So I was like, yeah, you know, we're probably not the right time to talk about investment, but I'd love to talk about your portfolio. And very fortunately, there was a guy who kind of was responsible for like giving recommendations on technology to their, their portfolio. And we met with him and, you know, they already had a few companies using Gainside and then one thing led to another and it's been, you know, it's been awesome. And we would, they became almost like a partner, you know, a channel for us, so to speak. Right. But in that process, they got to know us better and they heard great things from their customer, their portfolio and our business did well. And so they were just kind of like staying on top of us. They did a great job. They're super professional, great people. And we were always impressed by them. They would invite me to events. And, and so it was very much like nur- them nurturing us. And then, then what happened was uh, to the end of 2019, right before pandemic, no, sorry, 2020, in 2020, we, um, uh, you know, we had gone through like the early part of the pandemic and our business ended up actually, we like basically, we hit our plan for 2020, like despite all the ups and downs. And so in late 2020, we were trying to figure out, do we start a path of trying to go public eventually, or do we you know, do something now and maybe, maybe, you know, do a future, you know, equity event down the road. And we opted for the latter. We wanted to build a business for the long term. We didn't want to rush anything. And Vista basically like inbounded in. They said, hey, you know, we've been talking for a long time. You know, here's an op- here's a, you know, here's a price, here's a deal. And then, you know, they're great to work with. And so that's what happened. So unfortunately, it wasn't like us courting anyone, but I would say that the transferable learning is, you know, like the truth is you're always relationship building, right? So every interaction you have with any investor, you're building relationship. And I think one thing that that it wasn't so much in the Vista era, but with our VCs, one thing that actually helped a lot was we had our VCs come to our events um, and talk about community and investors, right? So you're like, they come to your event, they see how fervent and how rabid your fans, your customers are, right? In terms of just being excited and then they get excited and then they want to do something, you know? So that was something that was, uh, Vista probably is influenced a little bit by that, but our venture investors definitely were. You know, I've never seen you this pumped. You're the most pumped I've seen you like uh, uh, over the years. Um, I thought you'd come in and say, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm investing, I'm writing uh, checks. I'm on to the next thing. You're, you're super energized. What is different this time than the live office exit? Because yeah. you sold that for 150 this, million. There's a great question. There's a few things. So, you know, I've done Gainsight basically from the beginning and live office actually came into a company that was already around a great company, but you don't get to put your fingerprints on it as much, right? Um, number two, um, this just feels like it could be a huge category and a huge area. And I, I was like, I, I think this has legs to it, right? Uh, and number three, I, it is true, Lloyd. I've honestly never been more excited about Gainsight. It's nine years in, it's kind of weird. I should be like, tired or trying to do something different. And by the way, there's a lot of other opportunities out there. And I'm sure there's all kinds of money people can make and so many different things. I could care less. This is my thing. Um, this is like the one that I want to do like as, as forever, as long as I can. And part of it is, it is actually starting to get really good. Like it's getting like the, the core business and the customer success community is becoming real. Like it's real. It's not pure evangelism anymore. And we have all these new things that we're doing, which are exciting challenges for me. I think part of it's like, you kind of, you know, some people reinvent their job by getting a new job or doing a new company. And that's fine. Some people reinvent their job by like reinventing their job in the job. You know, that's like, you know, we did an acquisition three years ago and that gave me a whole new challenge. And, you know, how do I learn how to do that? Well, and so I, I'm excited that there's just like new challenges. I'm very lucky that I have a job that I just, I love. I mean, every Sunday night, I'm just like fired up for work. When passion becomes profession, you can become Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the jacket, the, the wardrobe that, that you're speaking there. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. So looking back, what was the toughest, lowest point of your journey and how did you navigate it? Oh, yeah, that's there's a lot, but I'll give you one, which is like, we were, um, and I know we're wrapping, getting close to the end, so I'll make this a good kind of one to wrap on. We were... Um, you know, we were this like really hot, comp- a pretty hot company early on, raised a lot of money, Bessemer, Battery Bank, have amazing investors. And we were growing off small numbers and frankly, just like off of like belief, like we talked about those early adopters and the community. And then, you know, we, we had a hard time crossing that chasm. You know, so our AR, you know, went from like the first year was like 1 million and then like 5 million and then 16 million and then 32 million is pretty good growth, right? And even, even, even for today's era, but definitely for that era. And then, and then we, you know, we started slowing down um, and, but we had ramped up a lot on our team. So we hired all these salespeople. We hired this great CRO, very experienced person. And, um, and our, what happened was we were still growing our revenue, but our new bookings were slowing down or we're kind of flat. And so our ARR growth was slowing down. 
And it was because we got ahead of the market. There just weren't enough companies. To, there weren't enough CSMs. We're not, we were like the whole, if you did the math, like we were the whole TAM, like there was nothing else to get. And we'd be calling customers that just, they were just not ready for Gainsight yet, you know? And so that was a tough time because what happened was our sales slowed down, slowed down. We missed a couple of years of like missing our numbers, burning a lot of money. Um, our CRO quit, a um, nice, really nice guy, just, but you know, he wasn't into the whole evangelical thing. And frankly, it was like the wrong time. A few other people quit. Tried to raise money like our 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 fa failed like series I guess it would have been Series F like a six round and <laughs> we got an F on our Series F <laughs> we we literally like I know so many investors and they all like li like me or whatever we'd love to work with you and we got rejected by all of them every single one every single investor that you could imagine you could name we got it rejected by um, so everyone said no people quit now the company wasn't going out of business we had money in the balance sheet there was no like this wasn't some like dramatic tale but um, what we did was we figured out, God, we were, we were ahead of our skis. So what did we do? We did a couple of things. Number one, I was like, look, I want to ride this thing into when the market's ready, when the garden's ready to bloom. So we didn't, we didn't cut any staff. Luckily, we're very fortunate that we figured this out before then, but we basically stopped hiring people. So like at the end of 20, I don't know, 17 or so, end of 2018, we were 700 people. And beginning of this year, we were 700 people, but our business like more than doubled, probably 150% growth since then. So our business grew a ton. So we went from like burning, you know, I don't know, 40 million bucks went that year to like literally this year, basically being break even and, and, and last year too. And so our business sort of got like really good. And then it started accelerating. And by the way, we did instead, we couldn't raise money. So we did a debt round, which I know you, you're probably familiar with too, right? And so all that stuff ended up being great in hindsight. Like the business, like where we are now is only because of all those decisions we made, but it was freaking hard while it happened. It sucked. You, you have a lot of karma points uh, from the community. So that's going to, that's always going to go far, right? And there's a little yeah. bit of karma that touches everything. But you also made a great focus on health. I've never seen you happier. And also wow. like you, you look great, right? Was that, uh, was some of the, those mental health hacks or working out hacks uh, part of like getting you here? You uh, yeah. I mean, so it's funny that, that I, I can only thank or blame the pandemic for this, right? It's like, just at the beginning of the 2020, I think everyone went one of two ways. Either your health either got better or got worse, right? I was very fortunate. Mine got way, way better. And, you know, I walk a ton every day and I work out a lot and I, you know, eat well and inter intermittent fasting. I do every single thing that you can imagine. But what it's done for me, Lloyd, exactly right, is I'm just in this great headspace every day. I'm so, like, I, you know, I worked out this morning. I feel so excited. The energy just comes from that. So whatever way you take care of yourself, you know, whether it's music or dance or meditation, in my case, it's kind of health and fitness. It's, it pays off, particularly if you want to do category creation community, because you need stamina, right? Just like running a marathon, right? Community is a marathon of the mind. There you go. That's a good tweet for you. So yeah. <laughs> community is a marathon of the mind and you need a lot of energy. You bring a lot of energy. I yes. think well, on, on the personal side, is there any specific challenge? Are you training for a natural bodybuilding contest you should <laughs> i have i have nothing i would certainly love to get it they i never i've been best shape i've ever been in my life i would love to get a six pack being vulnerable so that's my that's my overshare if i had to have a goal but i will never share that with anyone nobody will ever see whether that happened or not but for my own self I, that's what i like but i just i just want i like i like being healthy it's just something i'm into i, I by the way i apologize it's been such a fun conversation i do have a hard stop now but thank you so much for uh including me Thank you so much, Nick. It's been great and wishing you fantastic success. Thanks everyone for joining us. Love and peace, Nick. Thank you. I love, I love and peace to you too. Thanks so much. See ya. Bye.